Okay. Yeah, we'll start. We'll keep time. Uh, so, yeah, we invited everyone to join us as soon as possible, but we want to be accurate and want to correct <coughs> the initial latency. So, yeah. Uh, Alex is here with us. He is a technical evangelist in Amazon. So, Alex, what is an evangelist and what do you do as an evangelist? Can you please explain that position to us? Sure, thank you. I, I'm just a software engineer like I guess most of you. I'm, I have a web development background and I just like to talk and, and share my experiences and kind of, yeah, be here right now. <laughs> okay, so an evangelist is someone who is a developer basically, but is out there and promoting the whole lifestyle philosophy and technology. Yeah, it's more like sharing tips sharing and experiences it. and mm -hmm. use cases and code yeah. uh, and, and blogging, you know, yeah. doing all sort of content creation. Beautiful. And, yeah. And how, I will ask you too, <laughs> how did you like the unconference, unconference concept? Did you find it interesting and did you find the opportunity to share what you know uh, at, a, or, or at an event like that? Yeah, it was pretty cool because usually you just present what you have to say, but having a conversation and being you know, 20, 15 people instead of 200 makes it yeah. a bit more intimate, so I really enjoyed it. Beautiful, beautiful. Glad you liked it. Okay, so Alex will talk about serverless now. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So hopefully some more <laughs> folks will join us in a few minutes. But let me get uh, the background and what we're going to talk about today. Um, so again, yes, I'm a technical evangelist with Amazon Web Services, but before that I was just a very happy software engineer coding all day. Uh, I work in a startup for almost five years. Uh, I organize some events around Europe and around the world. Um, and I also have some sort of data science background, so we were just talking about machine learning. I, I like doing a little bit of that too. And you know, before joining AWS, I was using AWS for almost five years uh, as a very happy customer. So I know what it feels to be on the other side if you're using AWS or if you're not using AWS. Feel free to ask me anything today. I'll be around or after the conference or using the app uh, or on Twitter, wherever it works for you. Um, so what's the agenda today? What are we talking about? What is this serverless uh, concept? So I want to get some foundations there about what is serverless computing, because I understand it might be perceived as a buzzword or as a new shiny thing that nobody's using. It's not true. And a very quick introduction about that. And then I want to go into some patterns. That's the topic for today, some reusable architectural patterns that anybody building applications on AWS can use uh, and reuse and to, to give you some ideas to maybe sparkle some new projects or, or uh, whatever comes to your mind. So I want to focus on four categories of patterns. So we'll start with web development or websites or microservices because that's a very, very popular one for serverless computing. And then we'll go on with streaming and how do you deal with analyzing data and streaming data, real-time data. And then we'll go on with uh, data lakes or data analysis, how do you actually analyze data at scale. So maybe you're familiar with the concept of data warehousing and building reports and running those uh, four-hour queries on your five petabytes data set. So data lakes is a different way to do that, and I'll share with you how and why you can do it serverlessly. And the fourth category is machine learning. So we just talked about it. I just want to give you some ideas and patterns about what you can do with serverless when it comes to machine learning. We were discussing a similar topic with the previous speaker even last night. Um, so what are we talking about? Why, why even serverless computing? Where does the word come from? So who of you has heard of it at least or is familiar with it? Okay, not too many. Good. So for all the others. The idea came around five years ago when we, when AWS, uh, I was still a customer back then, when AWS launched a service called AWS Lambda. And the idea behind it was that, this is our uh, CTO, Werner Vogers, the idea behind it that Werner announced was that all we want to do as developers, um, I can relate to that, is that we just want to write business logic, something useful, not boilerplating, not just glue to glue stuff around, not uh, copying and pasting the same stuff or over and over between projects. 
That's not what we want to do. We want to focus on what really makes a difference in your project, in your organization, in your startup, whatever makes sense in your company. And serverless and AWS Lambda back then enabled that. Um, how many of you come from or are still in that world where getting and provisioning infrastructure takes weeks or months like to get a physical server? Nobody? A couple of folks? Okay. So that, that's what it was like for everyone uh, before the cloud existed, and the cloud brought those five to six months period down to minutes of hours. So you can get, you know, now you can get, in, for the last 10 years, you could get CPU and compute capacity in minutes. Like you spin up a virtual machine, you get that compute capacity. As soon as you don't need it anymore, you kill it, right? Um, what happened with serverless is that that time, that time period required to get compute capacity available, went down from you know minutes or seconds down to hundreds of milliseconds. So the idea is that I can say, I want you to run this code right now, and that code runs in around 200 milliseconds, and then when it's done, it shuts down, and you don't pay for it. So that was the crazy little idea that. Um, kind of led the way to AWS Lambda in 2014. And uh, if you think about it, it's not just, hey, now I have compute capacity really, really fast. Instead of weeks and months or minutes or hours, I can have it in milliseconds. That's, it's not just it. It's the fact that you're not just getting a virtual machine. You're getting a full serverless platform with potentially infinity, infi infinite capacity and that comes with all the, you know, all the best practices related to high availability, resiliency, security, and so on. Why? Because all you provide is the code, the application layer. Everything you know, below it in the, in the stack, the cloud provider takes care of it. And we can scale up to infinity and down to zero whenever we need. So that's why the point is all you need to care about, all you need to focus on is your business logic. And uh, today we, I want to talk about patterns and reusable architecture of patterns rather than showing you how to do it and what is, what is a Lambda function, what languages you can use. You can use Java, you can use Go, .NET, Python, um, um, a few more. But you can even bring your own languages. We have customers now bringing their own mainframe COBOL code into AWS Lambda, like kind of shifting 20 years into the future from their mainframe architecture, just going straight to Lambda so they can run that workload in parallel thousands of times instead of <laughs> just once a day. So that is shifting the way you think about compute and the way you think about maintaining infrastructure and so on. And that's also why we tend to um, categorize AWS services now in three big uh, classes or categories. On the left, you have everything that run just on EC2. EC2 is our um, virtual machines or instances service. And you can just spin up an instance, install anything you want on it, and, and everything can run on EC2, right? Open source frameworks, your custom code, whatever. But that's the opposite side of serverless. That is, you have servers, you have to provision them, you have to maintain them, build a cluster, you know, patch it every day, and so on. Then we have a sort of middle layer that we call managed. And here you find services that kind of abstract away some of the challenges of the just on EC2. Um, because maybe you have automatic backups and because maybe you just say, I need three machines. And then the service does everything for you about replication and availability and so on. And in this middle category here, you find a lot of services for authentication and databases and machine learning. Uh, but the real category that was born in the last five years is the serverless category, where you find a full ecosystem, a full platform of services that really do not require you to be aware of infrastructure at all, do not require you to say, hey, I want auto-scaling from 10 to 50 machines. There is none of, nothing about that. Why? Because the scaling is completely automatic behind the system, as well as the pricing. The idea that you can stop paying for your EC2 machine or your database like Postgre or MySQL or a SQL Server, even if nobody, you know, when nobody is using it, it's kind of a game changer in my opinion. So most of these services on, on this side, if I have zero, zero customers, zero users, zero traffic in my system, I pay zero as long as that holds. And then you scale up linearly. 
Um, so I think that's also a, a mental shift, a game changer. So we have mentioned no server to manage, but also no container to manage, no cluster to manage, nothing on the infrastructure side, networking, security, patching the operating system, patching the um, uh, operating system dependencies, none of that is a big issue. Uh, how many of you last year had to patch all the security vulnerability in your machines overnight because it was a big deal? Okay, if you were on Lambda, we t AWS took care of it. All the Lambda users didn't have to do any of that. And that's hours and hours of, you know, man hours spent. Um, so it's not just about not paying for idle capacity, it's also about not paying for maintaining and provisioning and taking care, kind of cuddling the <laughs> infrastructure. And the scaling is flexible and the availability is built in. You know, if you build uh, an architecture on EC2, you have to make sure you have different machines in different data centers so that if the physical infrastructure goes down, you are still up and running somewhere else in the cloud. So you, we have the concept of AWS regions and AWS availability zones, so you can build resilient architectures. With Lambda, all of that is also implemented, so you don't have to take care of making sure your system is highly available and deployed to multiple physical um, data centers. We do that as well. So it's not just the hourly or the cost, it's about all the maintenance. And what, just because I've mentioned cost, you don't pay by the hour or by the month or by the minute. Not even, not even by the second. <laughs> you, here you're paying by the 100 millisecond intervals. So if you spin up a function and say, run this code, take this request and execute this uh, piece of code, if it runs for 250 milliseconds, you pay for 300, you know, the next 100 millisecond interval. And that also a game changer because you're not paying for idle, you're exactly paying for the millisecond uh, that you are running. So think about it. Even cost optimization and performance optimization changes a lot in this new uh, world of serverless. What about the life cycle? So we have talked even last night at the conference about you know, some, uh, what actually happens when you decide to run this code. We have a technology internally called AWS Firecracker. It's a Rust implementation of Lambda, open sourced on GitHub. And basically what happens under the hood is that you know, when you say run this code, we have to download your code, start and use some sort of container. It's actually a micro virtual machine uh, written in Rust. And then we bootstrap the runtime if you're choosing Java or if you're choosing Python or .NET or Go or Node.js, whichever version. And once all of this is ready, we can finally run your code. And all of this, instead of minutes or hours, takes around you know, a few hundred milliseconds and then we can run your code. But after all of this is done once, running your code has no impact. So after the cold start of spinning up the, the runtime, you only have warm starts for that Lambda environment, and you just run your code already in memory, but you don't pay for it if no execution comes. So it's a, that's more or less the model. What about resources? How do you set up memory and CPU and networking capabilities? Well, uh, we tr tried to simplify back in 2015, and it's still fairly simple, meaning that you don't have full control of how many CPUs, how much RAM, uh, how much networking bandwidth I have. You have one handler that I call um, power, <laughs> because uh, it goes, it's actually called memory. It goes from 128 megabytes of memory up to 3 gigabytes of memory. That's the range that you have. But remember, if you give it more memory, you also get more CPU, more networking, more everything. So think of it as a sort of power handler. If you need to do more, if your workloads are CPU, networking, or memory intensive, just give it more power. And uh, actually, your invocations might be cheaper as well, because think about it. You're paying by the duration of your function. So if you give it 10 times more power and it runs 10 times faster, you're paying the same, because everything is proportional. So I, I like to say that for the first time in the, in the history of IT, you can take a workload, give it more power, run it faster for the same price, or even sometimes for cheaper. So this doesn't happen very, very often. I, I'm particularly excited. About this, uh, that's why I built a tool that I call AWS Lambda Power Tuning that allows you to basically optimize your Lambda functions for the specific workload. Um, so what happens is that you provide um, 
your Lambda function as input. This is a state machine implemented with AWS step functions. Um, and uh, the tool configures your uh, function to use multiple power configurations, run the function in, you know, using multiple um, uh, power configuration, and then in the end, it's able to tell you, hey, for this function, for this input, this is the optimal memory and power configuration. So you can somehow optimize the cost and the performance of your functions in a data-driven uh, fashion. And you know this costs 0 0.0000 nothing to run. So you can even run it as part or of your uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, uh, CI, CD pipelines. So you automate the whole thing. Uh, what about local testing? What about local debugging and uh, development? Well, there is a tool called AWS SAM CLI that is based on AWS SAM, the serverless application model. He's also a squirrel that allows you to kind of define your application, serverless applications in an um, infrastructure as code way. And then you can also run uh, your functions locally and your API gateway stuff locally in your laptop. So that's kind of useful and it's also open source. So you can go and check and open issues and fix problems and help the community. Uh, there, are, there is also a set of tools that allow uh, services that allows you to do continuous integration. So you have code commit, it's kind of GitHub inside AWS, but you can also integrate with Bitbucket and other sources. You have code build if you want to run tests or build artifacts, compile your code and so on. Use whatever you want for testing. And then you can even deploy and do advanced stuff like safe deployments. So you can say allocate only 10% of the traffic to the new version of the code. If anything goes wrong, just automatically roll back to the previous version of the code. So you have very nice integration of uh, tools and services like these to automate the whole uh, deployment pipeline as well. And that's enough for the introduction. I hope if you are not familiar with serverless, now you have a clear idea and you know it's not just a buzzword. If you have more questions, ask me on the app or ask me on Twitter. Now let's <laughs> go and focus on the on the patterns. So the first one I want to talk about is web, microservices, API. How many of you are building APIs on a daily basis? Most, okay, a lot. So this is very common, this is very popular with serverless. Because typically you need to provision a server, the server is staying there even if you have zero API calls for three hours. And sometimes you have to go and restart it and patch it and oh, the operating system is broken. So all of that disappears. And the typical architecture for a serverless website is more or less like this. So you have a top branch where you deploy a static website. Usually you have a CDN in front of it so you can just distribute it globally and it's super fast. Uh, you can uh, put all your assets, files, HTML, CSS, JS, all your React magic into the S3 bucket and just serve it to customers, to clients. And then, to make it dynamic and interesting, you have a backend, you know, that bottom branch. And here you want to have the typical two or three tier architecture where you have an API layer, could be a web server, we have a service called Amazon API Gateway that does that. It does actually a lot of things, but think of it as an HTTP interface on top of your Lambda functions. Then you have the compute layer running your business logic, and usually you have some sort of database layer. Here I have DynamoDB, Amazon DynamoDB, but it could be PostgreSQL, Oracle, whatever, whatever database you're using in your backend that works. Um, so there are a few different ways to use API Gateway specifically. So let me give you a few alternatives how we can make this architecture more interesting, more secure, more scalable, more resilient, and so on. So um, there are three different types of API data point, uh, API endpoints that you can use. The first one, which is the default, the, the one that we announced uh, three years ago with API Gateway, is the edge optimized. So this is a, a typical uh, endpoint for uh, applications or APIs that are to be used globally by an uh, infinite number of clients, possibly uh, the whole world. So the idea is that we take care of distributing a CDN in front of, of your, and your endpoints. We have more than 160 edge locations around the world. So if a customer, if a client from Australia wants to request uh, your um, request something to your API in Dublin or in the United States, you know, it goes through the Amazon network instead of going through the internet. That's much faster. Uh, and that this is the default. Just start with this if you are in trouble or in doubt. Um, and an advantage 
uh, I'll say uh, an alternative to this would be to put your CDN in front of both the front end and the back end. Why? Well, uh, there are a few reasons you want to do that. Uh, the first one, the, the super common one, is that if you manage to do this, you have both back end and front end under the same domain. A lot of front end and back end developers like to have that comfort zone where you don't have course issues and backend and front-end can just talk to each other uh, on the same domain and they're happy. And if you want to enable some caching for some of the backend APIs, you can do it very easily on, at the CloudFront level. But also CloudFront comes with a lot of features that we implement at the edge, such as uh, Lambda at edge, for example. That's a variation of AWS Lambda that instead of running in the data center in the AWS region, it runs on the edge locations, so as close as possible to your users. So you may want to use Lambda Edge to, for example, uh, filter out requests that are not authenticated, so they are not hitting the backend, uh, so you're saving some money there, and you are optimizing the latency for the final API client. So there are a few interesting use cases. If you want to do A-B testing, cookie-based, or uh, whatever is relatable to uh, request response headers, uh, URL manipulation and things like that. You can do that with Lambda Edge map, mapped to CloudFront. So you can filter both backend and front end with the same logic. Um, so there is a second API endpoint that we call regional. Uh, so regional endpoints, instead of being globally distributed for you to, to be used by a lot of customers on the world, they are de de deployed only to a specific AWS region. So it could be Frankfurt, Ireland, London, Virginia, Tokyo, wherever it makes sense. There are more than 21 today. Um, and this is particularly interesting, for example, if you want to build multi-region architectures where you have the same stack like this, the, the same one we had for the backend deployed in a region, uh, and again, the same backend deployed in another region. And then, for example, with your DNS, service or your own, this is the Amazon Route 53 DNS service, you can do, you know, uh, based on the availability or based on the latency for the final user, do traffic shifting between the two or three or four regions that you have. So why you want to do that? Well, for example, for resiliency. So it doesn't happen <laughs> very often that a whole region goes down. But if you are at Netflix, scale, for example, this is something <laughs> that helps you being super, super re resilient. Actually, they have a, a specific way of doing these things. They call it chaos, chaos engineering, and sometimes they bring down a whole region just to verify if they can easily, in a matter of seconds, shift everything uh, to the other regions active. Uh, so that makes sure that they uh, have built a resilient architecture and that they can withstand failure, even at the regional level. So this is a cool example of that. Uh, you can always put in CloudFront in between if you want to leverage Lambda Attach, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, there is a third API type, and API endpoint type, that we call private. So this is useful for all the cases where you don't want your API to be publicly available to anyone on the internet with or without authentication, that's another topic, but you really want this API to be available only to your internal services, not to the whole internet. Um, so you can enable a private endpoint that's available only in your VPC, and that's also an interesting way to provide APIs to hybrid architectures where you have part of your infrastructure deployed on-premises. Now maybe you want your on-premises data center to be able to invoke cloud services with a private API. So you can do that with private API gateway endpoints. OK, let's go back to the traditional setup. Uh, how can we make it secure? Like, is it secure by default? There is a lot that is managed and serverless services do for you. But uh, let me tell you some of the features. Well, all the CloudFront content is static and, and encrypted with certificates. There is a service called ACM, Amazon Certificate Manager. It's one of the few free services that does certificate renewal for you, and it's very convenient to use, so have a look at that. But then CloudFront itself implements a lot of feature about georestriction. You can have signed cookies, signed URLs, so that a specific cached object can be accessed only by a user if you provide uh, a signed URL. Or you have DDoS protection. If at some point you have a DDoS attack or something, not only uh, CloudFront blocks it, 
but you're not even paying for those requests, and those requests are not hitting your backend, so you save a lot of money in there as well. Well, S3 comes as well with a lot of bucket policies and access control lists kind of features, so you can make sure only the right objects are accessed by the website. If it's a static website, usually you only have public stuff in there. But in case you want to make some match, you know, you have full control over who can read what. Usually you have Cognito to manage authentication. And uh, if, you m if, you m if you use Cognito and API Gateway together, you can build pretty sophisticated um, access policies to say, like, this category of users can only access these endpoints, only the get endpoints, but not the post endpoints. You know, you have very uh, granular access, uh, uh, granular control over those. Um, Lambda comes with a lot of um, security and uh, um, interesting integrations. So by default, for example, your Lambda function would not be able to read from your database. You need to explicitly provide permissions for your function to read from that database. If you're using Dynamo, you can even say, this function can only read these columns uh, of the database. So you can be super, super granular to provide fine-grained access, not just star kind of access. Never do that. Um, well, if you're using Dynamo itself, it's encrypted address, you have VPC endpoints if you want the database to be accessed by more traditional services as well. So I would say security-wise, uh, this kind of uh, architectural pattern is pretty well covered. You can always extend it to add more, to integrate more security, to add your own custom encryption with your encryption keys if you want to make sure you, know, you have full control over the encryption. Um, there is another advanced feature called um, Lambda uh, authorizers or custom authorizers. So for example, typical scenario is I want my clients, maybe a mobile application, to log in using an um, identity provider. It could be Google, Facebook, Amazon, any OpenID Connect kind of SAML thing. Uh, and so they authenticate with it. They identify their, they verify their identity, and then they get a token back. And then they can send that token to API Gateway, maybe in a header. And uh, API Gateway, of course, doesn't know if that header is valid or not. So you can just say, hey, before invoking my backend here, invoke a Lambda authorizer, which is another Lambda function, not your backend, another Lambda function that can take the headers and maybe via API verify the headers, cache, and generate even a custom authorization policy for that specific client. And then, you know, if the Lambda authorizer says, okay, the request will go on to your backend and you're good. So you can implement very sophisticated, interesting uh, custom authorization logics here. You might even have this Lambda function reading or writing to a database and do all sort of stuff. Okay, that's enough for web and APIs. Let's move on to the second pattern, data processing. So if you do data processing, usually you have a few different challenges depending on what you're processing. If you're processing data, video, images, and so on. Let's focus on data today. Uh, there is a family of services that we call the Amazon Kinesis. Uh, family, and here you have different products and services for different needs. Uh, let's focus on the data ones. One of my favorite services ever is Kinesis Data Firos. It's a service that allows you to do data ingestion without, in a very, very serverless way. Let me tell you about that. So imagine you want to ingest data. It could be logs, records, statistics from your um, application, whatever, maybe from a client site, website. Um, you can have your Kinesis Firos delivery stream in the middle and have any sort of producer or agent putting records into the stream. And then you can just, with a couple of clicks or a couple of configuration lines, configure the Firos delivery stream to deliver those records to a destination. The destination could be S3, could be Redshift, our data warehouse, it could be Elasticsearch if you want to do geographical queries, full text search queries, and so on. Or it could even be a um, a backup of the raw data, just in case if you needed to replay in another testing environment and so on. Uh, one of the best features of Firos, two best features in my opinion. First, it's serverless. There is no capacity planning. It just scales up to infinity. And you don't pay for it by the hour. You pay for it ba based on how much data you are delivering. So if you have zero data coming, you pay zero. To me, that's the best feature ever. Um, the second feature is that you can optionally connect a Lambda function to it. And this Lambda function will take all the incoming records and it's able to uh, process, enrich, 
filter, manipulate, and do whatever you want before those records are actually delivered to the destination. So I think that's a pretty interesting way to do data ingestion without managing any cluster or server or container and so on. Um, you can always kind of change, if you look at the difference, you can always have an API endpoint in front of uh, the delivery stream instead of directly invoking the service API. Uh, so your clients, maybe a browser, can just do a get or a post or a put uh, API. You can always do the same with CloudFront and Lambda Attach if you want to do it as quickly as possible at the edge instead of in the data center. A uh, few best practices. Uh, you can choose the buffer size and the buffer interval for the object. So if you can't afford waiting longer, the service will be able to compress more to encrypt altogether and do all sort of features on a larger chunk of data. So that's uh, usually recommended. But with the, literally a couple of clicks, you can also enable compression in any format you like, and you can enable parquet format transformation. So you can say, I want to analyze this data later on. Please transform it into columnar format for me. So it's ready to be analyzed at scale. Um, there's another service called Data Streams, Kinesis Data Stream. So this service existed before Firos, and a lot of customers were using it to get some data in, map a Lambda function to it, and then use the Lambda function to write into S3 or into Redshift or into Elasticsearch. So Firos is solving that problem. So you can use Kinesis Data Stream for all sort of other use cases where you need to process data in real time instead of just storing the data into a bucket or, and so on. It is not fully serverless because there is still the concept of shards that needs to be quantified. So you can say, I need 10 shards, and a shard will give you a specific amount of read and write uh, throughput. So you still need to do some capacity planning. Uh, but you can also choose the batch size of you know, how many records the processor function will receive at the same time, you know, from 1 up to 10,000. So you can choose this, the size of the batch. Uh, a lot of customers decide to use a, f a pattern called the fan out pattern. So if, if in case you want to uh, process the data as quickly as possible, um, you can just take the data out of the stream and then th um, kind of send it to another layer of functions that will actually do the actual processing. And that speeds up things. Uh, why is it important? Because if this function is slow to do the processing, um, this stream is kind of falls behind, and you have a lot of data accumulating in there, kind of like a buffer. Um, so you, and the thing is, if you add more Lambda consumers, each Lambda consumer is completely independent. So you might have multiple data pipelines in which every consumer is uh, processing all the data, not just, it's not like a queue, it's little like a data buffer with the up to seven day data retention. So think of it as a, uh, a bit differently than a queue. Um, you can also do something similar with real-time analytics. So in case you want to um, understand what's happening right now in real-time in a system, for example, imagine that you have some uh, sensors sending data maybe every 10 seconds about temperature, pressure, and so humidity, and so on. And you want to have a system that, say, for example, if the average temperature of the whole building goes above a given number, you know, send an alarm or start doing something. Um, you know, you can do this not in a real-time fashion, but if it's a time-sensitive problem, you want to be able to do it in a matter of seconds, not minutes or hours, right? So what Kinesis Data Analytics allows you to do is to specify uh, an SQL or a Java query. You, you can choose uh, between a couple of different methods. But if you choose an SQL query, you just provide an SQL query with averages and slums and whatever aggregation you like, and um, with a, maybe with a moving window. And you know the output of that query will go to a Lambda function. So you get maybe the average temperature as a result of that query. And Lambda will be able to say, if bigger than 25, you know, send an, SM an SMS warning to the operator or whatever makes sense. Uh, what does a query look like? Something like that. So you have the concept of uh, a stream pump, and you can pump the data in a temporary stream. In this case, I have a 10 minute moving interval, but you can also bring it down to 10 seconds. In our example, you do the average every 10 seconds, 
as soon as something is wrong, you, you send the aggregation to a Lambda function and send a warning to someone. You can have this tumbling or moving sliding window and do all the sum, count, whatever aggregation makes sense to you. Right. So third patterns, uh, data lakes. How many of you have heard of data lake so far? A couple, not too many. So it's just a different way to do data analytics. Nothing magical. It's another buzzword in my talk. I'm sorry. Um, but the characteristics are very similar to what you would consider a data, analytical, uh, a data analytics workload in a data warehouse, maybe. So you want to collect data, store data, consume and analyze this data, maybe to build a chart, a dashboard, a report, and so on. The big difference is that you can store any sort of data, not just relational data. It could be se semi-structured or even unstructured. And the best feature is that you're able to decouple the storage part of the system from the compute part of the system. This means you're not bound to a given uh, cluster capacity or uh, storage capacity because that's our budget, we can't grow more than that. Or this query is low, there is nothing we can do to make it faster because otherwise we need 10 more machines, we can't afford it. Completely different way of thinking. You have as much storage as you want on Amazon S3 and then you have as much compute as you want because we manage the cluster of, of compute, and I'll show you what it looks like. So the idea is that you can do fast ingestion. The schema of the data <coughs> is not defined when you write the data, like in most databases. It is defined when you go and read the data later on. So it's a different way of thinking about data in general. Uh, everything is around S3, uh, so you can have different services to do catalogs, you can have different services to do authentication and API management. Uh, I already showed you how to do data ingestion. So if you're using Kinesis and your delivery destination is S3, you're good to go with a data lake already. Uh, and then there are a few different ways to analyze this data. I'm, I'm going to show you a specific service called Amazon Athena. It's my second or third uh, favorite service in the whole platform. So what does it look like? The idea is that you have some data on S3, completely unstructured. It's not a database. It's CSV, JSON, Parquet objects on Amazon S3. And you can have crawlers to automatically detect the schema of the table using AWS Glue. And then you can have a few different services like Athena or maybe Redshift Spectrum to query that data without managing a, a big cluster. And maybe the output of these queries will go into some sort of visualization service if you want to build reports and charts and export dashboards, for example. The service comes with a, <coughs> with a nice UI where you can just put in a query and you, get, you run it and you get the results. Uh, very intuitive. So let me show you an example with Athena where I'm using the uh, Google Engram open data set that you can find on registry.opendata.aws. And uh, I'm just running a query, you know, it's just SQL with some where clause, some group by, some ordering. So this query runs in about 44 seconds. I, I challenge you to do this on your laptop. It might take a couple of weeks, so don't do that. Um, the data that is scanning because of partitions, because of the group by, because of the where clause, is about 170 gigabytes. That's fairly OK scale, not petabytes, but still. Um, the thing I didn't mention is that the cost of this service is also based on how much data you're scanning. So you're not paying for a database by the hour if no query is running. No query running, you don't pay for it. That's the idea, always. So this query, because it is scanning 170 gigabytes, I'm paying about 85 cents of a dollar. The pricing officially is $5 per terabyte. So unless you already have a 20 terabytes data set, um, you know, it's fairly cheap, and you can also kind of customize and uh, optimize the queries for cost. Because if you optimize your queries with group by and where conditions and uh, partitions, for example, it not only they will run faster, but they will be cheaper. So I like this idea of if you optimize for one dimension, like performance, you are at the same time optimizing for the other dimension, that is cost. Usually these two things don't really go together. In this case, they do. Um, you can define partitions, but uh, I want to speed up a little bit because we only have five minutes left. Um, you can also do all sort of uh, MapReduce 
kind of uh, use cases where you have data on S3, you can have a splitter and a set of mappers uh, implemented as Lambda functions, and maybe you aggregate the results into a DynamoDB table or somewhere else, and then you can have a, another set of reducers that will go and reduce the data on S3. There is a, an interesting project by the University of California in Berkeley that managed to achieve more than 40, or may maybe this number is updated, maybe even 50 or 60 teraflops of peak compute power just by using S3 and Lambda together, using the events and the triggers. So whenever there's a new object, you can trigger Lambda function and use scale out like that. Uh, they even managed to build a, a framework on top of it to run like linear algebra kind of use cases. So if you need to invert a huge metrics, uh, you can do that in this kind of uh, way using S3 and Lambda as well. Okay, last scenario, last, last category of patterns. So we have about four minutes, so I'll be quick. Um, how many of you are doing machine learning today? Not too many, I imagine, a couple of you. And that's exactly why I'm here, because I also thought, hey, I'm not a data scientist. I have a machine learning background. I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I'm not even touching these things. The good news is I think you should, because now a day is making an application look smart and sound smart and act smart is not that difficult if you have a set of services that help you with that. So let's ignore for a second all the hardcore machine learning stuff here. But if you want some sort of algorithm pre-built where you only bring the data, the algorithm is there, and you build a machine learning model with your own data, there is a middle tier that we call Amazon SageMaker that can help you with that. But let's also ignore that level for today. Let's focus on this top layer up here. We call them AI services, artificial intelligence services, where you have just an API. As a developer, you invoke an API. You say, hey, transform this text into audio so you can let your application speak for you. Or transform this audio into text so you can transcribe your uh, audio conversation. So you can do a lot of smart things without really having any machine learning experience. So let me show you what kind of things you can do in a serverless way using some AI services, for example. Let's imagine you have a website or a mobile application where your clients can upload images, maybe a, a selfie or whatever, and then you can store these images on S3. This is kind of the grandfather of every architecture. Storing data is S3 always. And then you can automatically trigger a Lambda function and maybe you want to start a complex workflow. So as I showed you the, with the visual uh, state machine that I showed you before, you can use a service called Step Functions to build a visual workflow of things that maybe need to happen in parallel. And what do we want to happen in parallel? Maybe we want to use Amazon Recognition, that is our you know, object detection, face detection, uh, text detection, uh, service that works with images. So in parallel, you can see, you can say, detect all the faces, all the labels, do detect if there is any moderation, if there is any nudity or whatever, I don't want it to be there, and uh, detect if there is any text in the image, you do all of that in parallel. And then the output of this workflow goes back to a Lambda function, and you can store the data maybe on Elasticsearch or on DynamoDB. So you can provide a, a search functionality to those users that uploaded selfies or whatever your application needs. Um, let's imagine a more sophisticated solution where your users can upload not only images and selfies, but maybe even audio and video and you know complex stuff. So in these use cases, they also upload stuff to S3. You trigger a Lambda function wherever there is a new asset. You spin up a state machine that orchestrates a complex workflow. And in this, this workflow, you can do things like, hey, it's, if it's a video, use Amazon Recognition Video to do object detection, emotion, uh, emotion, and activity detection on the video. At the same time, use Elemental Media Convert to transcode the videos and make them available for smaller resolutions, and you can build all the uh, customizations you want on the videos. But at the same time, in parallel, also transcribe the audio channel and uh, run it through Amazon Comprehend to understand the language, the sentiment, the key phrases, the key um, components of the language part of it. And when you have done all of this in parallel, you can put all this stuff on a tree or maybe on Elasticsearch to provide, again, these users a way to search those multimedia objects uh, through an interface, maybe using the metadata as well as the image. 
And this is, this is not fantasy, <laughs> this is a solution that you can deploy basically in a couple of clicks. It's already defined as a CloudFormation template. Have you heard of the service called Amazon Connect? Not too many people, it's fairly new. And it's basically a serverless contact center as a service. So you say, hey, I need a contact center where the operators can talk to people and record conversation and analyze data in real time and so on. So let me tell you what you can do with Connect. Um, imagine you have a customer and this customer wants to, I don't know, reschedule an appointment with a, with a doctor. We are out of time, give me 20 seconds. Uh, and Instead of you know, going to an office and spending the afternoon, this customer can just send a voice message or a text message. And Connect will take it, uh, but instead of having an operator, for example, you can have Amazon Lex, which is our conversational chatbot service, take care of the request, analyzing the content, understanding that, hey, I want to move my appointment from Tuesday to Friday. Okay, great, I got the new dates and so on. And then we pass the information to Lambda, Lambda puts the data into the Dynamo table, verifies that the appointment is correctly, correctly saved, and maybe sends back a notification to that user via SMS or via a mobile push notification. So this way we have automated the whole process without managing any cluster by using you know, all the features I've mentioned. Last thing I want to mention is Let's imagine we want to actually put a human behind this, because we still like uh, to work with humans. So imagine these two people are talking to each other, and you can um, extract all the records, all the data about the call, so the time it started, the time it ended, blah, blah, blah. You can also, as I mentioned before, run a pipeline to transcribe the audio of the conversation into an S3 object, and in parallel, I can, I can run the transcription through a comprehend, Amazon Comprehend to analyze the text, the, the emotions, uh, the key phrases, and so on. Once you have all this stuff, doesn't it look like a data lake to you? You have all these objects, different formats, different schemas on a tree. Well, you can use services like Amazon Athena and Amazon QuickSight to visualize this data. And all of this without managing or provisioning or patching any server or any cluster. So you can just focus on the business logic. And my time is up. Thank you for coming. My call to action for you is go and build something cool. I hope all these patterns and these ideas and these services will help you build something that makes sense for your, you, for your side project, for your organization. So go build something. Thank you, everyone.